Okay, this is an interview with Richard Kaiser, uh, the Hampton Inn, Terrytown, New York, February 7th, 2003, approximately 8.20 a.m. The interviewers are Michael Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Sure. Uh, Richard R. Kaiser, K-E-I-S-E-R, and uh, I was born in Brooklyn, New York. What else do you need? The uh, place of birth and date of birth. Date of birth is uh, August 30th, 1949. Okay. Um, prior to military service, what was your, was your educational background? I graduated uh, high school 12 years. Okay. Um, when did you enter service? I entered service in September of 1968. And uh, were you drafted or enlisted? I volunteered for the draft. Volunteered, okay. Um, what branch of service did you go into? I went to the uh, United States Army. Mm -hmm. Now, did why did you select the Army then? If you I volunteered for the draft, and I was drafted the draft. into okay, the okay, Army. Okay, yes, right. Well, okay. the, the guy next to me went into the Marines. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, where did you receive your basic training, and could you tell us about sure. the basic training you received? I went to um, from Whitehall Street, New York City, where I was inducted. I went uh, by train to Fort Jackson. South Carolina for in processing, and then from there I went to Fort Gordon, Georgia for my basic training. Um, while I was in basic, I volunteered to go uh, airborne and uh, went to AIT in Fort Gordon, Georgia, the same place, um, because it was an airborne AIT um, post and it also was a uh, military police post. Mm -hmm. From there, I went to uh, Fort Benning to jump school. I was the last, one of the last classes of draftees to go airborne. After that, you had to uh, be a regular army or re up for another year. So, uh, from jump school in Fort Benning, I came home on leave and uh, went directly to the Republic of Vietnam. Uh -huh. How many jumps did you? Uh, five jumps. Five jumps okay. in the military. Uh -huh. uh, what was your unit that you were? I know the 101st Airborne, right. but... The first, first Battalion, 506th Infantry. In fact, the, the Band of Brothers from World War II, the same unit. Okay. I was in Delta Company. Okay. And only realized that by re watching the movie. <laughs> How would you rate your training? Do you think it prepared you for what you My, in Vietnam? Um, in the States, uh, it was pretty basic. It was probably the same training that most guys uh -huh. received after Korea. Uh, my most intense training was when I got to Vietnam and I was uh, went to a an in processing uh, in Cameron Bay and I went it was assigned to the hundred and first and they sent me to in training at Camp Ray, which was an in training in Vietnam, where uh, you sighted in your rifle, they taught you about booby traps, they had actual combat situations, mock situations, mm -hmm. live fire situations. Was that in Benoit? Uh, you're right outside of Benoit, right. I was in Cameron Bay, went to Benoit, Camp Ray was outside of Benoit, mm -hmm. and uh, from there, of course, the 101st at that time, um, late 68 was up north, um, we were originally down south, they were up north in the uh, Central Highlands. Would you tell us about your combat experiences and your role in the conflict in chronological order then? In chronological order, uh, if, best of my recollection. Yes. <laughs> and some of the stuff sticks out a little better than mm -hmm. the other stuff. But uh, actually, uh, when I was assigned, I was assigned um, prior to getting to Delta Company, first to the 506th uh, Battalion. I was uh, trained as a sniper. Um, I also went to a recon company, uh, I did some long-range patrol, um, approximately two months' time. Uh, at that time I asked for reassignment, I was reassigned to uh, Delta Company, first to the 506th Airborne, the 101st Airborne Division, and we were a reactionary force for the rest of the battalion. By that I mean um, we slept by our helicopters, and when any other company in my battalion uh, encountered any kind of a firefight or a hostile activity, we went in to help them out, and that was our job. So, uh, not only that, we also secured areas for they were building fire bases into the Asia Valley. At that time, the Asia Valley was uh, 
and North Vietnamese uh, infiltrated the course uh, as we did. Well, we, our job was as an infantry company, we went in and we secured the area and then the combat engineers would come in and they would level it out. They would bring in the artillery and build bunkers and we would move on as we moved into the Asia Valley. Of course, our ultimate objective, of course, was in May of 69 was Hamburger Hill. One of the better known battles of Vietnam. Were you I, based out of uh, Camp Eagle or Camp, Camp Evans? I was in first of the uh, first of the 506 was in Camp Evans. Second of the 506 was in Camp Eagle. Uh, of course, those bases were originally the first cav, and we had taken them over after the first cav was sent back down south. Mm -hmm. First cavalry. Uh, basically. Um, when after securing the fire bases and uh, we were doing reconnaissance and force, uh, of course, clearing, um, we kept reconning the other perimeters of the uh, fire bases. Um, we encountered skirmishes, nothing major. Uh, we we were take we took minor injuries, uh, minor minor kills uh, during the during that course. Uh, it was sporadic course until we got into the Asia Valley as soon as our job was as soon as the monsoons came after they left we would worked our way into the valley building fire bases as we went <clears throat> my best recollection was before Hamburger Hill was that um, that as we built the fire base and we secured it and they and they brought in the artillery and it became a full-fledged fire base and we moved on as we moved up to secure another area, we I remember at night sometimes watching that fire base that we had just been built had been being overrun, and and, and you could see the sappers and and the uh, you know at night it was it was kind of eerie. We were like one step ahead of them all the way going in, and uh, basically that was what I did until uh, we hit Hamburger Hill. I was there eight months, um, at which time uh, my I didn't, we weren't the initial battalion to go in. Um, we got there, I think, after the second or third day that it, I think it's May 10th it started. We got there on the 12th. Um, of course, we had the longest walk up the hill. <laughs> uh, we took many, many casualties. Uh, I was wounded after the, the 10 or 12 days that we were there uh, on the way down. I was wounded. Um, we hit a a straggler, North Vietnamese patrol that was also leaving the hill. The, on that hill, the, it was the twenty, the twenty ninth NVA division, which was Ho Chi Minh's uh, pride. It was like his red guard is to uh, present day Saddam Hussein. It's Iraq, but uh, they were built in. They had concrete bunkers, tunnel systems, un underground garages, underground hospitals. Uh, it was just. Uh, it was a as General Zayas, Melvin Zayas was the general uh, uh, commanding officer of the 101st Airborne, and of course at that time uh, Congress wanted to know why we were so involved with that hill and we took so many casualties. Uh, it was almost, a, that was a, probably the turning point of the war. That's when uh, Senator Kennedy from Massachusetts and General Zayas, the commander, had the uh, little conflict about how to fight this war. And I, I think General Zay, you know, uh, the commander said it the best. He says, my job's here to find the enemy, and, and that's what we did. And uh, we took heavy casualties. I went up, uh, my company, probably, uh, I think, 117. We weren't at full strength, uh, coming down with probably 68 guys. Uh, I, I believe all total... Uh, uh, 58 were killed. Not only, I mean, total. Not only in my battalion, but uh, there was there was other battalions. Mostly it was 101st. It was three, four battalions at 101st, and some Arvin uh, South Vietnamese troops that uh, really weren't that involved in the taking of the hill. But uh, as I said, after getting up the hill, um, the monsoons came. We couldn't get the wounded out. That uh, was a mess. It was raining. The, the Total bombing and devastation uh, was solid mud. Uh, they made the movie about it. Uh, some of it, the, the guys crawling and holding on in the mud trying to get up to the top, that was kind of realistic. Uh, 
I was going to ask you your opinion of that. Yeah, that was the, the movie. Of course, it was Hollywood. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of things. Uh, there was whoever advised the advisor of the movie was a lot of the things you know about learning how to brush your teeth and things like that. It, that was kind of true and, because it, you know they were guys that were in the service that did know how to brush your teeth and, uh, and things like that. The sanitary conditions, of course, that's what they tried to impress on you. But the actual uh, lay of the land, uh, the mud. The uh, total destruction uh, it was quite real, but the, th the deal was it was that the the bunkers they were in concrete bunkers and the bombs weren't penetrating the bunkers, and that's why we had so much resistance. Uh, Did you get to see any of the bunker complexes? Oh yourself? yes, oh yes. After it was over, we, we had we had swept all the bunkers. It was quite impressive. Uh, uh, we 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 recovered. Numerous uh, small arms, uh, large artillery pieces. Uh, it was amazing what they had, all Chinese, uh, Chai Com stuff and Russian made stuff. It was incredible. It was, uh, see, for me, it was, it, it was more like a conventional type because they were uniformed. Mm -hmm. um, my experience with Viet Cong, very few. I never, uh, we never had that situation. Booby traps weren't a big thing up in the Central Highlands because it was mainly uh, the jungle was so thick. Uh, we were in triple canopy. Uh, by that I mean three layers of jungle. Uh, if it rained, you know, it, you didn't get wet. But if you banged up against something, you get soaked because of all, all the. It was almost like a rainforest type thing. I guess you could compare that to. But, uh, the environment, you know, the the bugs. Uh, you know, the, the snakes, the, it was just the thing that, you know, forget forgetting the enemy, it was just trying to survive in the tropical uh, weather. It was not my kind of weather. Still today, uh, I'm not a hot weather fan when it comes to stuff. Humid, humidity, I think is the word. Uh, uh -huh. But uh, I, to keep myself busy sometimes, I used to kind of try to identify a different bug every day, which was easy to do. <laughs> and, uh, and they had uh, quite an array. But it was a very fierce fight. It was um, myself, my company, uh, my, my squad. I was a squad leader at that time. Through attrition, uh, it, you became a squad leader very fast uh, if, you, if your company uh, saw a lot, of, uh, a lot of action, a lot of firefights. Uh, you just move up. You went from ammo bearer to machine gunner to radio operator to uh, next thing uh, when the sergeant then you moved up to sergeant squad leader. It was just through attrition because of guys being wounded, being killed. Uh, by that time, uh, after uh, we had most of our company was seasoned uh, guys, we had very few new guys at that time. Um, yeah, during the conflict, we started to get a lot of new guys. They called cherries, of course. And, uh, what was the morale like the, amongst everybody? Well, the morale. The reason the morale was. The morale was good up to the point where um, the monsoons came and we couldn't get our men out. We didn't. We couldn't get supplied. We didn't have ammunition. We didn't have. Food was a big thing. I mean, I remember we went. We went about three days without getting resupplied. Uh, I had one can of uh, uh, turkey and noodles. I remember it was a sea ration can, and I had. Uh, I had saved that and. <laughs> We hadn't eaten like in three days, and I said, "Well, I'll, I'll eat this tonight when nobody's watching," you know. And I was, and I had, was heating it up with uh, some C4 out of the back of a Claymore mine, and, and uh, well, I forget, you know, it, it was hot, and I grabbed the lid and I dropped it on the ground, and I wound up eating it anyway because I was that hungry, you know. And I remember that, and uh, being my experience of being uh, wounded uh, was quite another deal. Um, I think that. You know, uh, made made my experience on the hill itself and getting to the top uh, kind of minimal because uh, on the way down, um, as I said, we had a lot of new guys. Um, we drew straws to see who was going to walk point back down the hill. My squad, there was four squads in our in our uh, company, and I drew the short straw, and I had uh, five new guys, and uh, only three of us were seasoned guys and uh, so I chose to walk, walk point. Um, sometimes that was not the worst job to have because especially um, if you were to hit a booby trap or something or walk through an ambush they always let the point guy walk through first feeling that they would get mm -hmm. 
the um, second, which was a slack, they call a slack man, and then after the slack man was usually your officer, your NCO, your lieutenant, or whatever, but uh, your radio operator, that's how they usually work. So I chose to walk point only because, I, you know, I, I was concerned about my men and concerned, of, you know, with myself and after what we had just been through. And we were going to... Uh, China Beach, Eagle Beach, we had our own, 101st Airborne had their own compound on China Beach, which was called Eagle Beach, of course. Uh, we had been there once before, I had been there personally once before for three days. For um, someone that doesn't know what that was, what was that, China Beach? China Beach was the, <coughs> uh, the coast of Vietnam, which mm -hmm. was uh, probably one of the most beautiful beaches in the world as far as I was concerned. I've been to the Bahamas and uh, Bermuda and nothing compares to that beach. Uh, and we had a compound there. It was an R&R, &R, the Rest and Recuperation Center, and we marched in there as a, as a company um, for three days of R&R, &R, and it was quite a feeling. Well, on the way down from Hamburger Hill, our assignment was to um, be security for Eagle Beach approximately for the next 90 days, so that would have sent me right home and with a nice suntan and a and uh, so uh, naturally that didn't happen. Um, coming down the hill, uh, as I say, um, through the chopping through the jungle uh, with the machete, of course, the jungle being that thick, and the hill, the, the top of the hill, of course, was devastated. But coming down on the, when we hit the lower level, of course, was still vegetation. And um, walking. Uh, I was walking alongside the trail. I wasn't walking on the trail. Of course, we didn't like to walk on the trails because of, you know, booby traps or ambushes. <coughs> ambush, ambushes mainly was the big thing with the NBA, North Vietnamese. So um, as I was coming around almost a turn, I, I had a Kit Carson scout who was a Vietnamese, uh, what they call Chu Hoi, somebody that was a North Vietnamese that was captured, became one of our allies, supposedly, and uh, he was walking behind me. We called him Kid Carson Scout, and he yelled, VC, and as I turned, I saw that what happened was, as it was just like we I was walking this way, the NVA were coming this way, and we met head-to-head, -head, uh, probably not maybe a couple of feet farther than you are right now. And we both it was like Marshall Dillon and the Riot Earp, and we both opened up, and next thing you know, the whole side of the mountain was blowing up. It was incredible, you know. And I, we were on the way down; it was all over, you know. So uh, I was hit. My uh, my radio operator was hit. Uh, I had four guys down right off initially, and, my, and um, out of the four, it was me and the three new guys. Um, we tried for cover. There wasn't much. It was a lot of uh, the paper tree type tree. It was like a flat. You could put your hand through like balsa wood type. But the cover, you know, it was nothing uh, we could hide. It was something to hide behind, but it wasn't much. Uh, I got to hide behind uh, this balsa type tree. I remember it being that way because I reached out my hand. I actually put my hand through the tree. You know, I said, well, this isn't going to stop much, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and I saw the rest of my squad had come up alongside of us, and uh, the rest of the company, we were walking in single file, and the rest of the company started coming up to help us out, and um, I remember guys laying there and being hit, and being hit on the left side, and the, most of the fire was coming this way, so immediately knowing that there was a sniper or a, as I looked up, I saw a muzzle, muzzle flash. The initial shot, I was shot in the stomach initially. The muzzle flash, I saw, I was shot, I was laying down, of course, and I was shot in the back by the sniper. I radioed back saying that there was sniper fire coming from the left. They came in and, and uh, the sniper was taken out along, by that time we had an uh, airstrike come in. Um, the airstrike came in, was a little short, landed almost on top of us, but to the right. Uh, we, we took casualties, but nobody had, that I know that died, that was killed from that part. But uh, the chopper, um, there was no time to cut an LZ, a landing zone for the, for the dust-off choppers to come in. So what they did was 
being that Hamburger, being the hill had been bombed so much, the 500 pound bomb crater holes we used that as a landing zone. So by the 40, uh, it was approximately 45 minutes later, uh, after being hit the second time, I, I got to add this that you know I kind of said, well, I better play dead here because I think you know I'm not going to make it out of here, and uh, because it was just mass confusion, of course, like anything else, and and. Uh, the North Vietnamese running in between us, us running in between them, and, and, and it was just mass confusion because, like I say, it was all over. Everybody was coming down. Everybody was at ease. It was a relaxing type of situation. And the next thing you know, we're involved in probably the, the fiercest part of my uh, experience on Hamburger Hill, and it was all over, you know. And, uh, oh, for me, because I was shot twice. Yeah. I, I, I took three rounds twice. I didn't realize it at the time. I was hit twice the first time and then once the second time. Um, as I, uh, as the medics came up, approximately 45 minutes later, the first medic came up and uh, he looked and he says, hey, we got to get you out of here. And he, and, he, and he gave me a shot of morphine. At that time, morphine came like uh, airplane glue. It was in like a little tube with a needle in it and they stuck it in your arm and they squeezed it. And they would pin it on your collar to let you know you had morphine. So that's, he threw a couple bandages, you know, he said, forget about it. I remember him saying, he says, he says, I got a lot worse guys. And I says, my God, you know, if there's more worse guys than me, I said, this has got to be something. You know? and, uh, and, and, you know, like um, I'm saying, well, what, in the next thing I knew, guys had come up, another medic had come up right after that with guys to pull me down to the bomb crater hole because the chop, the dust off chopper the medical chopper was coming in. So this medic comes up. Well, I guess during the confusion, a little side note, this morphine thing fell off. And the other guy says, oh, you didn't get morphine. And he hit me with another one, you know. So needless to say, I'm feeling pretty good by this time. <laughs> not not experienced, you know, uh, ever having morphine before. And um, they drug me down to the bomb crater hole. Of course, in the bottom of the bomb crater hole, the, there's, there's water, it's muddy. Uh, the chopper had come in, and um, I, I, I heard what I thought was the blades of the chopper hitting the tops of the trees, but it was machine gun fire. And they, um, they shot the dust off chopper down, and, and it crashed. And when it crashed, it caught fire and crashed and burned, exactly what happened. And I, and I could feel, in fact, my arm, I wasn't burnt, but I could feel the intense heat from the from the dust off chopper and right behind him came another one but he didn't come down that low what they did was they dropped the cable down and they hooked up uh, me and another guy now of course being on the influence of this morphine here I am swinging on this cable being yanked up in a chopper now not only is he pulling us up he's also flying away from the it's called the hot LZ and, uh, you know it was something out of apocalypse now you know and uh, and then I remember by the time they got me to the skid of the chopper, the, the medic had reached down and he had grabbed me, and he grabbed me by the back of the shirt. And I remember that's you know where, where I had been wounded and you know the the pain, the intense pain. And even though I was had that morphine, it was still painful. And I didn't realize it at the time, but the bullet had, um, you know, being under the morphine, the bullet had hit my rib cage and followed over to my spinal cord. And it shocked my spine, and uh, I was paralyzed, but I didn't realize it at the time. Um, I got to the medevac in Fubai, um, 85th vac, I think it was. 95th was in Da Nang, where I went later on. I got to Fubai, uh, and uh, they had the blow-up hospital, the blow-up uh, hospital units, which were air-conditioned. And that's, I remember trying to get off the chopper. And the guy says, stay right there, don't move. Well, I didn't realize it, but I, I couldn't actually stand up if I wanted to. And uh, they threw me on the, the stretcher, and they ran me into the uh, the field hospital. And the last thing I remember um, was laying on the, they threw me on the table, the operating table. And I remember the guy saying to me, this is going to hurt a little bit. And it was the cat, they were going to put the catheter in. Well, you know, I, after that, I, I think it was... The next thing I remember maybe was two days later. You know, I had come, come around and, of course, you know, uh, um, 
I had no feeling from approximately my rib cage down. Um, so, needless to say, I was quite upset about that. Um, as I look back at it, uh, in fact, I was more than upset. You know, I figured this was it. I'm going to be like this, and you know, as many other guys were. Um, and uh, the doctor had come in. I remember he was a little short guy. He was probably as young as I was, 19 years old, you know. He probably was older, but he looked like he was my age. And he said to me, uh, he says, you're going to be all right. He says, it, it, you know, he says, a couple weeks, you'll regain the feeling in your legs. And, you know, I had tubes in my, I had tube in my nose going into my stomach. I had a catheter. I had IV here. I had the whole blood coming in here. You know, as he's telling me this, I'm listening, and, and for some reason I'm hearing boof, boof, boof. And, and I said, I said, Doc, I don't, I says, that's, we were taking incoming mortars, and we have these blow up, we're in these blow up units, blow up, they're like um, big tents, and they're air conditioned. In fact, the company that makes them was from, was from New York. They just went out of business not too long ago. And, what they were doing, I, I saw that all of a sudden the doctors and the nurses running around with steel pots and flak jackets on. And um, what they did was they had a slide that went down into a bunker underneath. And they were sliding, these, mattress and all, were sliding these guys down, you know, because the mortar, they were mortaring the hospital, the field hospital. Well, the airport and the hospital, which the airport and the hospital were right next to each other. And, of course, me... Um, my negativity at that time was like, here I am paralyzed, and they were they're just running by me, and, you know, I was the last guy to go down and shoot. <laughs> it was probably my attitude at the time. My attitude was very, very poor. Uh, I was mad at the world, you know. Um, and we went down, you know, they slid me down, and, uh, you know, after that, we came back up. Uh, after that, they had actually had mortared, and they deflated the unit that I was in the whole day. So they had reconstructed it, and um, and they brought us back up. And two weeks, approximately two weeks later, what that doctor said came true. I started getting a feeling back. Uh, what happened was the bullet had shocked the spine. It was just a trauma. Uh, it was a bruise. Uh, you know, uh, he he described it to me like you know when you when you have a concussion in your head, it's the same type of thing. I didn't really care what he was talking about at that time. But so the feeling started coming back. Uh, they had to get me to Japan. Well, after they brought me, I had an operate that emergency operations there in Baifubai in 85th of Act. Uh, they sent me from there. Uh, they flew me to Da Nang, which wasn't that far. It was probably a 15 minute chopper ride uh, to the 95th of Act, which is in Da Nang, which is. Uh, there I had another operation um, on my back um, and my stomach. They had, uh, according to him, they had taken my, of course they take your intestines out to make sure there's no holes or whatever. They put everything back in. I'm sure they don't put it in the same way it comes out. But uh, <laughs> I was, you know, because I had problems later on after. Uh, but uh, I got to 95th of Act. I had another operation. Um, of course, all this time they're... Uh, giving you all kinds of pain medications and just to keep you quiet because I was not the best patient in the world. And from there, uh, they sent me to Japan for another operation because it was uh, it was a intricate operation. They couldn't do it in Vietnam, so they sent me to Japan. I went to Camp Zama. Where in Japan that was, a, um, I don't know how to pronounce it. I remember it was something like Kanagawa Ken or something, but uh, it was Camp Zama, Japan. So it was a beautiful hospital. It was regular. Uh, I remember it was cinder block because it was painted, typical army type, you know, painted with the epoxy paint on the inside, but it was cinder block. And, and I remember waking up there after the operation, and as I looked up in the ward, and it had this typhoon. It's a typhoon for typhoons, emergencies only. I'm going typhoons. I didn't no idea where I was, you know. And, uh, so you're in Japan. And, I stayed there, um, well, I guess approximately two months. And uh, from there, uh, I went before the board. Uh, they said, well, we're going to send you home. 
and what happened was, uh, like I say, was there eight months. I miss. I was looking forward to getting my early out. If you had spent, uh, if you had a, less than six months to go when you came home from Vietnam, I think it was around five months. They they released you from the service. Uh, if you were a draftee, mm -hmm. or, and so what happened was, uh, they sent me to a place called the Ponderosa, which was um, in Maryland. It was a, a halfway house type hospital for guys that uh, were seriously wounded, that were uh, had a lot of combat, had seen a lot of combat. It was like a deprogramming. You know? it, they deprogrammed you how to act, you know, when you got home, and uh, they also talked to your family uh, over the phone. And they had, um, I think, my family was it was mainly phone phone conversations. But I stayed there approximately um, oh three weeks. And from there they sent me to, they try to get you as close to home as you, as you can be. And uh, they sent, I put in, they asked me where I wanted to go. And of course, you know, at that time the Army, if you put down, you wanted to go to uh, South Carolina, they sent you to Fort Dix. But that's the way they operated in those days. And I put down, the closest hospital I remember was West Point, because it was right across the river from where I lived. So I put West Point. They sent me to Fort Devens, Massachusetts, which wasn't that bad. It was a four-hour ride. And uh, from there, that's where I recuperated. I was there approximately three more months. Um, I was allowed to come home on weekends, which were, were long weekends. You were allowed to go Friday morning, and you had to be back by Monday night. So, uh, And for me, it was hot, easy. Just hop on 287, get right across the, uh, it was out of Wor Worcester, Massachusetts. And I was home in four and a half hours. And uh, from there, um, I came back. Um, I was ready to be reassigned. They um, they reassigned me. I was an infantryman, 11 Bravo, which was uh, my MOS military occupational skill. When I came back, uh, they sent me to be an instructor down in Fort Benning, Georgia, to train OCS candidates on mortars. I knew absolutely nothing about mortars except for when they came in and they exploded. <laughs> The other part that I did know was that, you know, we did have a mortar company, to, you know, assigned to us. I used to, I knew what a base plate was. I knew most of it. I knew what an 81 was. I knew what a four point deuce was. Uh, I knew absolutely nothing else about how to fire one. I mean, I know you how to drop it in, but I didn't know how to set up the aiming circle. And, uh, and that's what I did. Uh, and it was kind of boring. And, you know, me being, uh, Coming back to the States, I was probably only one of the only few combat veterans that were here, except for the regular cadre, you know, that had done tours in Vietnam. And, uh, and at that time, the, the States, I guess, was kind of getting overcrowded with guys like us coming home that they didn't know what to do with. So they had a thing, if you had, if you had uh, more than six months to go, you could go to Germany. And all that. so I volunteered. Well, it'd be, just before that, uh, they asked me if I wanted to become the um, in Fort McPherson, Georgia, the driver's, the general's driver, chauffeur, was retired, was um, shipped off to Vietnam, and they asked me if I wanted to go get interviewed for that, you know, because they didn't know what to do with me. So I went from Fort Benning to Fort McPherson. They flew me over on the general's plane. I felt like a real big shot, you know. And uh, the general um, accepted me as his driver, but uh, I had orders to go to Germany, so I missed out on that. But uh, it worked out pretty good. I went to Germany. Um, I was probably the only one, uh, when I went to Germany, I was down s outside of Nuremberg, Erlangen. Um, I got to the reception area. They assigned me to this infantry company. Well, there wasn't much I could do. I had a profile. Um, you know, there was certain things I couldn't do because of my injuries. Uh, that was another problem that they had. Uh, I was... Like I say, I was de I had I had a CIB. You know, I was a, I was probably the only Vietnam veteran in that whole battalion. And the I remember the colonel saying, "Geez, you know, we really don't know what to do with you." And uh, he says, "You know, we can't give you some mediocre job." He says, "You know, you're a combat veteran. Now you're over here." And most of the troops in Germany at that time were young because they were guys that weren't old enough to go to Vietnam, or they had brothers, or they had some type of and 
so he says, but, and so I, he, he's, as he's looking through my 201 file, he says, oh, he says, I see you were um, accepted to be a chauffeur for the general in Fort McPherson. I go, yes, sir. He goes, well, geez, he says, you know, our general needs an aide. And he says, you're not a lieutenant, he says, but he says, you'd probably be do, be do the trick. I was very, you know, being airborne, I was very strack. I always had my stuff. I was always, my sh spit shine, I was always uh, well, well dressed in uniform, and um, I think that impressed him. And, uh, so I went and I met the uh, commander of the Fourth Armored Division, who was, and um, I met him. He had, uh, was a Korean veteran. He had uh, wounds about the face, and we would talk. And it was, he started talking, and I said, "Oh yeah, I got shot here, and oh, I got wounded here." And, you know, it wasn't my experience with an officer at all like that. You know, he was friendly, one to one. Oh, yeah, well, this and that. And he says, well, you want the job, you got it, you know. And I said, well, what does it entail, sir? He goes, well, he says, you'll have a staff car, you'll have a Jeep. He says, uh, you can live off post. He said, uh, you, when I have a party, you can be my, you'll be my bartender. And I says, no problem, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I spent five, I came home for 30 days leave. I went to Germany. Prior to that, I spent five months in Germany. I got to see some of my relatives. I saw most of Germany. That was the, one of the better experiences I had in the service. And I um, I got out a month early to go to uh, college under the GI Bill. And from there, uh, after graduating college, I went on to the police department. And uh, here I am. I'll ask you a couple questions, sure. if you don't mind. How, what were your relationships with the Vietnamese population? I really um, didn't have that much time. That I was probably uh, more interactive with the Mountain Yards, uh -huh. who were the people up in the Central Highlands. Okay, how about your relationships with them then? Very well. They were great people. In fact, I, every Memorial Day, we go down, I go down to North Carolina, and before the tribes, the Mountain Yard tribes are, were brought over here um, because of ethnic cleansing after the communists took over Vietnam, they tried to get rid of most of the mountain yards, and uh, of course the Eurasian children. And uh, they have a we have a picnic for them, mainly a lot of special forces guys because they worked with them, they trained them really. And uh, I've been there the last couple of years; it's been quite an experience. Uh, they brought them all over their their playing instruments and their their uh, ceremonial dress. It's quite a thing to see, you know. So I do that on Memorial Day. I go down there and, and uh, McLeanville. There's four tribes. I think the fifth tribe is in Florida, but four of them in North Carolina. They're originally brought over here covertly by a bunch of veterans that uh, got them into the country because we had kind, we had kind of. They were our probably our uh, our best ally in Vietnam, and uh, when we left, we just deserted them, you know, and uh, and they were there just to. Uh, if they didn't go into Laos and regroup and come back, they were ethnic cleansed. Um, how about race, race relations within your unit? Did you have many blacks and what were? We had, we had, we had, uh, I had, uh, I had a, in my squad, one black guy, one Mexican guy. We had, um, we had no race problems in my unit. Of course, we were an airborne, in fact, at that time, we the 101st was going right after Hamburger Hill, and they started withdrawing some troops. The 101st became air mobile, and they started uh, bringing guys in that weren't airborne qualified. And that's when uh, a lot of the the leg soldiers, they, we call legs, that weren't airborne qualified, started coming. That's when the problem started. That started after I was I was gone. Uh, we we all worked together. We never had a, a racial thing. But it, when I went to Germany, it was real. It was a real bad situation. The, the, um, the race thing was a, a big thing in Germany when I was there. What was your reaction to the replacement of Westmoreland? I really, at that time, uh, I wasn't involved in the politics of uh -huh. it as I am today. Uh -huh. And as I look back, um, it, you know, and, and then I, uh, on the History Channel, just watching about MacArthur and, you know, and politics and uh -huh. the president and, I think today, if 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 you leave, my my feeling is, if 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 the general's there and his deal, if he's the commander in chief, 
like Schwarzkopf did, uh, if his job is to do that, let him do it. And, uh, don't let the politics be involved in it. Uh, I think maybe uh, Westmoreland was too political, but being that type of rank, uh, I think you have to be political. You don't make a four-star general unless you've got some type of political backing and support. Uh, it's uh, sort of like Eisenhower, Pat, and type thing. Mm -hmm. uh, How'd you feel about the election of Nixon? Uh, I know you. Oh, I'm a, I was a Nixon guy. Mm -hmm. I, with the, when Nixon was elected, we were we had a big party. The war's mm -hmm. over. The mm -hmm. war's over. Because if what he wanted to do was just go and put as many guys in as he could and go from the south and work his way right up on through. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about the rotation system? That that was a problem. Mm -hmm. That was a problem. I think that's what separated. That's what gave the World War Two. That's what defined, well, Korea was kind of like, but that's what separated the, the veteran generation. If we had gone over there together, if the 101st, you know, which they did, but if we had gone together as a unit, as a company, as a battalion, and went home the same way, there would have been uh, more camaraderie. It would have been a, a, a moral issue you know, rather than, you know, here well, one day I'm, um, I'll give you an example. I'm having Thanksgiving dinner here at home, and that following Monday I'm in Vietnam. I mean, and I get thrown into this company of guys, uh, me and two other guys, and don't know anybody, and, and all they're worried about, they don't care about us because we're new guys, and they know that we're going to screw up, and they want to stay away from us until we get some time in, and they're worried about getting home, you know. It's not. It's not like it was. You know that. That was my feeling. It was very uncomfortable in the beginning. How do you feel about the peace movement? I, um, to be honest with you, um, a friend of mine, uh, a girlfriend that I had uh, prior to going over there, uh, she went to uh, New Paltz, which was a teachers' college, and it was a big, uh, it was a very liberal college at that time. It still is a little bit, uh -huh. but, uh, and. She was very much involved in the peace movement. You know, I was, I, I think of it today as like the Forrest Gump thing, you know. <laughs> and and uh, I really, you know, wasn't paying that much attention to it. Um, over there, um, it, we really, uh, of course, didn't know much about it. When I came home, of course, I came home uh, in early 1970. Uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, October, <clears throat> September 70, when I started college. And that's when I felt it because even at the college that I went to, it was it was very big, and you know Kent then had Kent State, you know, and uh, how and were you treated uh, as a Vietnam vet by the? Oh, uh, it was it was, it was rough. It was I'll, I'll add one example. I came home. Uh, I went to Grand Central Station. I was in uniform, and uh, coming home from the Army Hospital for the first time, I got back and. Uh, I had to be escorted on the, the 20 bus, which comes from the George Washington Bridge up to Rockland County. And I had to be escorted on the bus by the police. And uh, after that, I learned my lesson. Even when I came from Fort Devens, when I was in the Army Hospital there coming home, I was wearing civilian clothes. As soon as I got off the post, I just changed into, into uh, civilian clothes. That was a little rough part. It was hard to get over. Uh. See, because when I grew up, um, you know, it was still at 49. I mean, the country was still on the patriotic high from World mm -hmm. War II, and you know, everything was uh, soldiers. Is we used to play soldier. Uh, I mean, you know, I lived by Camp Shanks. Uh, Camp Shanks was a deembarkation point for World War II. Three million guys left from Camp Shanks in Rockland County. And I just, I was surrounded by it. You know, it was like part of that was your job. You know, you grow up, you're a guy, you go into service, you come home, and so this was a whole new thing. To me, you know, uh -huh. the kids today are different. I know my kids are the same way. They would that feeling of pa well, that feeling of patriotism is, uh, you know, wasn't as high as it was in those days. I don't think, and even today with the Iraqi situation, it's. How do you feel about the? Do you think America was justified in being in Vietnam? Very much so in the beginning. Very much so. Um, I think, uh, like I said, I think just about after I was leaving, I think that's when my opinion started. Of course, they weren't letting us do what we were supposed to do. Um, like my commanding general, uh, Zayas, told the 
Senator Kennedy, I'm here to find and fight the enemy. And that's what I did. Do you think the rules of engagement were detrimental? Oh, no doubt about it. The only thing that, you know, I impress upon people that, you know, say, well, you know, well, you lost the war. I says, but, you know, we won every major battle. I mean, we won Tet Tet. But Tet, what Tet did was awaken the country saying, hey, this is a real problem here. These people are. And General Giap, I, you know, I, I watch him now on PBS. I got his tapes and how he said he would suffer 10 Ten to one every day, he says, because we'll wear the Americans down. And he says, they'll lose at home. And he was right. He saw what was happening. And, uh, you, you mentioned you used the GI Bill. Yes, I did. Uh, to the fullest. I used everything. I went to college. I graduated college. Uh, I got on job training. I uh, used the VA. Uh, not for everything, but I used it for what I need to know. And I know, you know, from what you said when you came in, uh, veterans organizations, you joined. Yeah, I, uh, I did that later on. I did that uh -huh. right away. Uh -huh. um, in fact, um, when, I, when I came out of the police department and went with my sergeant in the 70s, he was a Korean vet. He said, oh, you got to join this. you got to join the Legion. He kept because we had a Legion post. I go, ah, I don't want to join. You know, what do I want to join? You know, I wasn't, I don't think, a lot of Vietnam veterans weren't involved with uh -huh. that, you know, and mainly why they started their own because they felt, and justfully so, that they felt that the uh, older generation veterans kind of shunned us, you know, and in fact it was, it took a while but before the major uh, organizations that accepted Vietnam veterans, and uh, that was a problem. Do you belong to any veteran, Vietnam veteran organizations? Oh, yeah, I'm a charter member of the uh, one in Rockland County, the VVA. Okay. Um, you kind of touched on this a little bit. What, what do you think about the Vietnam movies? Are there any that you think are a little more realistic than others? or Parts of, parts of them are, are uh, realistic. Uh, I wasn't in the Marine Corps, but I remember uh, the Full Metal Jacket, of course. That part where they're in the basic training, that was very real. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, because there wasn't much difference uh, to my, my experience and, and what I saw there today. It's a whole new different thing. I mean, but that was real. Uh, as far as the combat situations, uh, the movie Hamburger Hill, uh, parts of it were, were real. Whoever advised it was had was right on the money. I mean, but uh, a lot of Hollywood, of course. I mean, you can't make a movie. And what about the movie Platoon? Any of that? Platoon, uh, I wasn't I wasn't overly enthused with, but um, that's how we when that movie came out is when we started organizing our Vietnam veterans organization. We, we were standing out handing out flyers, and that's how we started our chapter in Rockland County, but I wasn't impressed with it. How do you think uh, your military experience either changed or affected your life? Well, it definitely affected my life. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I, I was uh, my I was going to college uh, after I graduated high school. My father had died uh, in a, an automobile accident when I was in, a junior, and there was no money to go to college. That's the only reason why I was went into the service. I think, I, but of course, many of my friends had graduated college and got drafted after they got out of college. So, uh, but I think the you know the trauma, a lot of stuff, you know, um, some of these psychological things that you carry around after, you know, um, you know, if you're a kid growing up and you're in a safe environment, next thing you know, you, you're next to people. You know, being killed and blown up, and uh, Did you suffer post stress. I would say I think every every anybody that was in Vietnam, whether it was, uh, of course, I was you know an infantryman, uh, you know, a, a combat guy. But I mean, I think everybody that was there, whether it was, <clears throat> I know a guy that drove a truck. Uh, he saw a, a hospital get bombed and babies burning. That was stressful for him. I mean, he had a real problem with that. And I think anybody that was there just was some type of traumatic experience. I mean, you know, not everybody fought. You know, I think it's nine or ten guys to keep one infantryman in the field. But, uh, I think a lot of you know guys were there had got problems. You know, had problems. If people were there, had a lot of our soldiers had problems when they were there. I mean, the drug thing. And, uh, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think most guys, uh, you know, suffered some some degree, whether it was one percent or ninety percent. Some guys really 
took a bit. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank Great. you. Good interview.